Hello guys, Winston here. I am unfortunately quite susceptible to peer pressure, so when a group of my close friends say they're going to sign up for a race, I usually end up going with them. I've never been particularly athletic, but after I graduated and started discovering the pull of adventure and the great outdoors, I realized that I needed to set a baseline fitness level to ensure that I would have the endurance to complete longer hikes without being a liability to the group. Running became this standard for me. The level of effort is scaled to your body weight, so in my mind it's an excellent benchmark. In the past three years, I've collected a couple participation medals from different events, and I'm finally reaching the point where I have enough to consider displaying them. So, taking inspiration from Steve Ramsey's running medal display rack, I decided to make one of my own using my Shapeoko. In my initial sketches, I wanted something in the same style. A holder where medals are hung across multiple slats. I'm personally not a huge fan of the ones that use a bunch of hooks on them. However, in designing my own, I just couldn't come up with anything using slats and hard angles that didn't feel blatantly derivative of Ramsey's, so I started scaling my aesthetic way back. In the end, I reduced everything down to two basic end caps and four slats. I eliminated the beveled cuts and used some gentle curves and subtle roundovers to create what I think is a very modest design visually. This means it can sit next to my budget IKEA grade furniture without looking too bold or out of place. I prototyped everything out in Fusion 360 and generated some toolpaths. The slats are easy enough to do, a rough 2D contour with 8,000 stock to leave, followed by a finishing pass. But, because you can line these up right next to each other when cutting, you can save some time by not recutting the area between slats. To do this, you need to break up the operation into two parts. The first part is the bottom side of the first slat which won't be shared with any other. Then you need to select an open loop contour around the other three sides. Since I modeled this slat with a roundover it needs to fit into a machined pocket, I need to pick a three-dimensional loop that will be projected onto the XY plane for the purposes of toolpath calculation. Next, we need to determine the pattern spacing needed for these toolpaths to work together. To the whiteboard. Alright, so each slat is one inch tall, the end mill is an eighth inch wide, we're looking for eight thou of stock to leave on the roughing operation, so 1 plus 0.125 plus 0 0.008 plus 0 0.008 equals 1.141 inches. Fantastic. Within this pattern, let's also throw in the finishing operation. That looks good to me, but I'm going to say we're going to cut 5 just so I have a spare in case something goes wrong. Now, for the end caps, I'll adaptive clear the pockets because it's the right thing to do. Quarter inch step downs will exercise a greater length of my flutes on my 8th inch long reach end mill. Next, we'll contour finish the walls, then clean up the floor of the pocket even though no one's ever going to see this, it's just good practice. One thing I didn't do the first time that I should have done was to apply negative stock to leave so that my slats would fit better. Internal features will almost always tend to be a little undersized because of backlash and deflection, and external features oversized, at least when climb cutting. More on that in a future video. But because of that fact, you need to widen this pocket by a couple extra thou to avoid an interference fit situation. Finally, to cut out this piece, we'll do a roughing and finishing contour. Now unfortunately, the stock I want to work with has a bit of a cup to it. I had picked out the straightest board I could find at the big box store, but in the couple months between when I'd bought it and when I finally got around to making this project, the wood had inevitably moved on me. If I planed it down, I'd lose some thickness, and there were some parts of this build that I really wanted at the full 3 quarter inch thickness that I designed them to. However, since I hate wasting wood, and the slats would be fine if I made them 5 eighths of an inch thick, I resolved to still make use of this 1x10. Now I could run this through my loaned thickness planer, but the rollers can sometimes flatten out thinner or softer woods, and your cupping will just bounce back after the board comes out the other side. My preferred way to flatten a board is on the CNC. I placed a length of my 1x10 on the bed of my XL, concave down. This way I would have two lines of contact against the table instead of a board that wanted to seesaw. Zeroing off the wasteboard, I planed down from a height of 0.8 inches down to 11 sixteenths. I'd cut off a little extra on this board so I had to trim off the excess. After I'd isolated one flat face, I flipped it over and went from 11 sixteenths down to the final thickness of 5 eighths. Then I swapped in my 8th inch long reach end mill and started cutting out the slats. This part went off without a hitch, although I did end up manually overriding my feed rates to 90 inches per minute based on how easily it sounded like my machine was cutting. I keep forgetting that pine is so low density and so soft that it cuts like a breeze. I also noticed just how slow my rapids were. When my Shapeoka was skipping an already cut segment, the travel speed of my gantry was agonizingly slow. By default, the Shapeoka's motion control board is set to rapid at 5000 millimeters per minute, or just under 200 inches per minute. I know it can do better, so after this project, I cranked it up to 500 inches per minute. Side note, only do this if you have an easily accessible kill switch, because any crashes that happen are going to be more spectacular. This applies to both running into gantry limits and also part and fixture collisions. 
After they were done being cut out, I slapped on a scrap piece of pine that was 3 quarters of an inch thick from a different project to cut out my end caps. Since I'm referencing off the wasteboard for all of these operations, I don't need to re-zero my z-axis, which is really convenient. When these were done, I pulled them off the wasteboard, and can I just point out how perfectly I nailed my depth of cut? Alright, now we need to deal with the problem of a square peg in a round hole. These slats need to be rounded over to fit the radius of my pockets. I'll install a 1 16th inch roundover bit in my router, test it on a piece of scrap to make sure it's not protruding too far, and finally get around to shaving off the corners from my pine. I'll also round over the edges of the end caps to soften them up. Next, I'll put a tiny bit of taper on my slats because they were just a little too snug and I didn't want to split my wood, kinda kicking myself for not adding in a couple thou of extra margin in my pockets. Even after sanding, these were still pretty tight, so much so that I didn't bother using glue. That way I can just break this thing apart and flat pack it when I move. Man, I could really use a wooden mallet right about now. Future CNC project, maybe? Anyway, after convincing my pieces to fit together, I applied a coat of Danish oil according to the instructions on the container. This just gives the wood a little more richness and protection while preserving a natural appearance. And it's plenty durable enough for the minimal handling that this piece will see. To mount it on my wall, I would use 3M Velcro strips. Just make sure that the Danish oil is fully cured or don't apply it to the back, otherwise your adhesive strips won't stick and you'll have to do something stupid like slathering on crazy glue as an interface material. And that wraps up this running metal display rack project. This is a type of project I think anyone can handle. You can even do it completely within Carbide Create to keep things really basic. So get out there, run a race, make one of these, tag me in an Instagram post or something. I'd love to see your take on a project like this. Before I go, I just want to plug my new podcast that I'm doing with fellow hobby machinist Eddie Kramer. It's called The Digital Fabrication Experiment, and the pilot episode is out now. We'll be chatting about machine shop life and shamelessly diving into CNC topics that most other maker and especially woodworking-oriented podcasts seem to gloss over. Where they view CNC as one of many accessories in the shop, we want to make digital fabrication the central theme of our podcast. So give it a listen, I'll have a link in the description below. Let me know what you think, where we can improve, and any topics you'd want us to cover in the future. And go easy on us, of course, this is only our first episode. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you in a week or two with another CNC-related project video.